In April 1861, a couple of weeks after the Confederate bombardment of Fort Sumter, the British newspaper correspondent William Howard Russell was visiting William Henry Trescott, a Charleston, South Carolina lawyer, historian, and diplomat who had recently served as former U.S. President James Buchanan's Assistant Secretary of State. Russell wrote in his diary about a conversation with one of the sons of South Carolina fire eater and newspaper publisher Robert Barnwell Rhett. On our return to the house, I found that Mr. Edmund Rhett, one of the active and influential political family of that name, had called. A very intelligent and agreeable gentleman, but one of the most ultra and violent speakers against the Yankees I have yet heard. He declared there were few persons in South Carolina who would not sooner ask Great Britain to take back the state than submit to the triumph of the Yankees. We are an agricultural people pursuing our own system and working out our own destiny, breeding up women and men with some other purpose than to make them vulgar, fanatical, cheating Yankees, hypocritical if as women they pretend to real virtue, and lying if as men they pretend to be honest. We have gentlemen and gentlewomen in your sense of it. We have a system which enables us to reap the fruits of the earth by a race which we save from barbarism in restoring them to their real place in the world as laborers, whilst we are enabled to cultivate the arts, the graces, and accomplishments of life, to develop science, to apply ourselves to the duties of government, and to understand the affairs of the country. This is a very common line of remark here. It was indeed a common line of remark to the frustration of some like publisher and statistician James D. B. DeBow, whose magazine DeBow's Review was devoted to Southern agricultural, commercial, and industrial progress and resource. Mind you, the part about slavery didn't bother him as he was an avid supporter of the peculiar institution. But he bemoaned the South's economic vassalage to the North which he calculated cost the region $100 million annually. Like Rhett, DeBow was a fire eater, but unlike Rhett, he wanted the South to industrialize in order to prepare for secession and independence. DeBow wasn't the only one championing Southern industrialization. An 1859 editorial in the Houston Tri-Weekly Telegraph said, we send our cotton to Manchester and Lowell, our sugar to New York refineries, our hides to Down East tanneries, and our children to Yankee colleges, and are ever ready to find fault with the North because it lives by our folly. We want home manufacturers, and these we must have if we are ever to be independent. Once the South did set about industrializing, it made an astonishing amount of progress in just a few years. Unfortunately, those few years happened to be from 1861 to 1865, while the South was fighting the Civil War against a much more populous and industrialized North. <music> Historian Emory M. Thomas laid out how much catching up the South had to do in his book, The Confederacy as a Revolutionary Experience. In 1861, the Confederate States had a population of just over 9 million, of whom about 3.5 million were slaves. The population of the United States was approximately 22 million. The South had less than half the railroad mileage of the North, and much of this track of 11 different gauges connected parts of little military or industrial significance. More than four-fifths of the old Union's manufacturing had been carried on in the North. Southern manufacturers in 1860 were worth 69 million, as opposed to 388.2 million for the Middle States, 223.1 million for New England, and 201.7 million for the West. Moreover, Southern industries included such enterprises as cigar making and the processing of chewing tobacco, which would not be very useful in making war on the Yankees. In 1860, the Southern states produced 76,000 tons of iron ore compared to the 2.5 million tons extracted north of Mason and Dixon's line. And in the same year, Southern iron mills processed less than 1 16th of the 400,000 tons of iron rolled in the United States. At birth, the Confederate South lacked not only an industrial base, but also the skills, raw materials, and transportation to establish war industries. Then there was the question of military firepower. 
When Jefferson Davis, the newly installed provisional president of the Confederacy, asked Josiah Gorgas, who ran the newly created Ordnance Bureau, for a status update, the news was grim, as historian William C. Davis writes. Somewhere over 200,000 shoulder arms of all description were available, many of them antiquated flintlocks, and only about 15,000 modern percussion rifles. Moreover, Gorgas reported less than a million rounds of ammunition, and most of that useless since he could barely find a quarter million percussion caps for firing them. They had no stores of lead, only about 60,000 pounds of cannon powder, and no field artillery to use it except a few ancient pieces that had seen service in the War of 1812. Worse, they had no machinery for making rifles, and the only cannon foundry in the South was Tredegar. He had a lot of work ahead of him. This state of affairs must have been all the more disheartening for Jefferson Davis, who had started calling on the South to industrialize shortly after the Compromise of 1850 passed to his dismay. Summarizing some speeches Davis made in late 1850, William C. Davis writes, He urged Southerners to determine to make themselves independent of the North. They should build railroads to stimulate the growth and transport of their agricultural products. They should encourage immigration from the North and from abroad to increase their population and wealth. They should commence expanding Southern manufacturing capabilities in order to make their own consumer goods from the cotton they grew, as well as to make their own shoes, hats, blankets, and every other purchasable article in order to keep Southern money at home. They should commence a system of liberal state-supported higher education to keep students in the South and preserve them from the contaminations growing out of an education acquired in the free states. On top of all this, he urged that the South build a stockpile of arms and munitions and establish the manufacturing capability to make them. In short, Jefferson Davis suggested nothing less than the virtual remaking of the South and, except for the one issue of slavery, largely in the image of the hated North. He proposed taking a rural, pastoral, semi-illiterate region and transforming it into a modern, industrial, self-sufficient nation. Achieving this, he said, then the South may apply the last remedy, the final alternative of separation, without bloodshed or severe shock. Jefferson Davis must not have believed that the South really would apply the last remedy, because starting in 1853, he spent four years as U.S. Secretary of War under President Franklin Pierce. By many accounts, he was one of the most effective men to hold the office, increasing the effective strength of the army, keeping pace with the newest technological development in arms, constructing new arsenals and armories, enhancing coastal fortifications, and stretching military road construction on the frontier. All that with little complaint and hardly a penny unaccounted for. I sometimes wonder to what extent Jefferson Davis, the Confederate Commander-in-Chief, was defeated by Jefferson Davis, the U.S. Secretary of War. Considering how much catching up the South had to do and what it was up against, Emory M. Thomas writes, The achievements of Southern war industrialists both inside and outside the government were indeed impressive. For example, during 1864, the state of Alabama produced four times more iron than any other state in the old Union. The gunpowder factory at Augusta, Georgia was for its time the largest in North America. The Confederate Navy laid plans for 150 ships and before the end of the war had constructed about a third of them, including 22 ironclads. And during 1863, Josiah Gorgas's Ordnance Bureau, the largest producer of war supplies, doubled its production of small arms from the previous year and achieved self-sufficiency. Gorgas oversaw the organization of large arsenals in eight cities, the establishment of lead smelting works, a cannon foundry, bronze foundries, a foundry for shot and shell, and a large shop for leather work. There were new armories, a manufactory of carbines, and pistol factories. As Gorgas wrote in his diary in 1863, where three years ago we were not making a gun, pistol, nor a saber, no shot nor shell, a pound of powder, we now make all these in quantities to meet the demands of our large armies. Thomas points to a number of conspicuous failures as well, some due to insurmountable circumstances and others to human error. One example is that the Tredegar Works was capable of handling about three times the amount of pig iron it was able to get during the war, and the Confederacy simply did not live long enough to develop its extractive industries to full potential. The shortcomings in the Confederates' attempt to create instant war industry were obvious, and as the war wore on, military action accentuated weaknesses. When Southern armies retreated from battlefields as they did with increased frequency during 1863 and 1864, they left behind many of the fruits of Confederate war industry. 
When southern armies abandoned land area, they also exposed mines, depots, and factories to capture by the enemy, and thus further limited the Confederacy's ability to conduct an industrial war. But on balance, the degree of industrialization achieved by the Confederate South was phenomenal. The Confederates sustained themselves industrially better than they did agriculturally, and far better than they had any reason to expect in 1861. Symbolically, in April 1865, when Lee's tired army marched and fought its way to Appomattox, the men exhausted their supply of food before they ran out of ammunition. In fact, when Lee surrendered, the remnant army of Northern Virginia had a sufficient average of 75 rounds of ammunition per man and adequate artillery shells. Considering what the South achieved industrially in the crucible of war, surely one of its greatest self-inflicted tragedies is that it did not set out to industrialize and develop a solid foundation for a modern independent nation long before seceding. As always, I've got additional context at my website. Click the link in the description below. And help this little channel keep growing by hitting that like button, subscribing, leaving a comment with your thoughts, and sharing with anyone who might be interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.